along. I think it's also important for me to say, someone just asked if they can add to the Hail Mary. My answer to that is, well, no, because you shouldn't or you don't need to add to the Hail Mary, because if your intention, let's say, is to pray for the dead or to pray for a loved one who's asked you to pray for them because they're sick or they're in need in some way, you just set your intention, right? Before you begin your rosary, you just say mentally, I offer this for Anne. I offer this for James, okay? I offer this for the repose of the soul of my grandmother, and then you pray the rosary. There's no need to put lots and lots of words. Intention where your heart is set is very, very important though. And we will find out more about this later on when I share with you what St. Thomas Aquinas teaches about distractions in prayer, okay? And uh, one question was asked uh, about praying the Regina Chaley instead of the Angelus during Easter. Well, yes, that is the custom. Uh, you don't have to do it. And if you don't pray the Regina Chaley, but you say the Angelus instead, uh, that's fine. Uh, I prayed the Angelus last week because uh, I was just hearing the bells and I just thought, yes, we should pray the An Angelus. Yes, it should be the Regina Chaley. Uh, yes, I probably made a mistake in that sense. But in another sense, I don't think that this is a hard and fast rule, right? There's a custom but it's not a law and it doesn't break the commandments of God. So that's nothing to be so worried about uh, whether or not it's the Regina Chaley or the Angelus that is prayed. Uh, here in my parish, they love to pray the Angelus all year round. Um, a, very, a more important question is a doctrinal question. Okay, Someone asked uh, that uh, about Mary who remained ever a virgin until her natural death. And he says, but Acts 1, 12 to 14, seems to indicate that Jesus has brothers, okay? Now, one of the things I assume is that if we are Catholics here, we know the doctrines of the Catholic Church. And if we don't know the doctrines of the Catholic Church, can I please advise you to read this book, the Catechism, all right? Every Catholic, please, you must read the Catechism. A bit at a time, take one paragraph a night. There's even, uh, programs that you can use to help you to read the catechism in a year. But in the catechism, we have the doctrines of the Catholic Church, which are the doctrines that we have bound ourselves to believe in by our holy baptism. All right. Now, let me read to you paragraph 499. The deepening of faith in the virginal motherhood led the church to confess Mary's real and perpetual virginity even in the act of giving birth to the son of God made man. In fact, Christ's birth did not diminish his mother's virginal, uh, virginal integrity, but sanctified it. And so the liturgy of the church celebrates Mary as Ai Parthenos, the ever virgin. Paragraph 500 of the Catechism. Against this doctrine, the objection is sometimes raised that the Bible mentions brothers and sisters of Jesus. The church has always understood these passages as not referring to other children of the Virgin Mary. In fact, James and Joseph, brothers of Jesus, are the sons of another Mary, a disciple of Christ, whom St. Matthew significantly, significantly calls the other Mary. They are close relations of Jesus, according to an Old Testament expression. And finally, paragraph 501, Jesus is Mary's only son, but her spiritual motherhood extends to all men whom indeed he came to save. So in the Old Testament usage, that's Jewish usage, we refer to our kin, that means our cousins and so on, as our brothers. Just as now as Christians, we refer to one another as brothers and sisters. Okay, this idea that we are in the same household of God. So if you're in a particular household, uh, you have a share of bloodline, you're called uh, brothers and sisters in that kind of, um, that's just a cultural way of expressing it. It doesn't let, literally mean that Jesus had brothers who were born of the same mother as him. Okay. Uh, and finally, um, I think, yes, let's just give two minutes to addressing this question. Uh, the question was asked about uh, how will the donations, your love offerings and so on be used 
and Anne brought it up thank, just now, so thank her very much for that. Um, I always find it amusing if people say that, uh, that the Catholic Church is rich or that I have a rich parish, because my answer to that would be, well, how do you know? Have you been looking at my accounts? Um, because uh, I don't think anyone here has been looking at my accounts and for my parish. Um, but the accounts are public, um, and uh, we have a £30,000 uh, deficit in our budget for this year. And in fact, I expect that the deficit will be even larger because the bills, um, the expenses, as you know, for everything is rising. Uh, even something like candles for the altar, for example, um, you know, these prices are all going up. And um, so with that kind of uh, budget deficit, uh, every little bit helps. Uh, and the time that I spend on writing these talks and, and giving the talks and so on uh, is time that I offer um, for the glory of God, yes, but it's also how we earn our living. And the, the money doesn't come to me, but it goes ultimately to the parish and to our community. It enables us to live and to carry out our mission. Dominicans are called mendicants in the history of the church. Mendicants is just from the Latin word for beggars. On one hand, we are beggars for the truth, uh, and that's why we study and we read scripture. But on the other hand, we are beggars as well for our material needs. We rely on your kindness and your generosity uh, in order to support our life, which is a life dedicated to preaching the word of God for the salvation of souls. So I'm very grateful for everything you can provide. Um, as you can see behind me, we have a beautiful garden and the beautiful garden is not maintained uh, by the friars because if we did it, it would all be dead and we'd be no flowers uh, because we're not very good at gardening, but it's provided, it's done for example, by a professional gardener. Uh, she does it for a living. So, you know, we need money to pay for those kind of services. We need to pay for our sacristan who enables us to keep the church open safely so that it's free from vandalism. Uh, here in, in, you know, in our part of the world, uh, if you leave your church open all the time and unattended, there is the danger of vandalism, there's the danger of, of theft, and uh, we need to have someone available just to keep an eye on things all the time. And it's just to give someone who's doing a job like that a just wage, right? a just wage for just work. That is what the gospel demands of us. So again, we rely on donations for that kind of thing. And lastly, uh, as people who have visited the Rosary Shrine, or perhaps you've seen our website, rosaryshrine.co.uk. That's a beautiful virtual tour that makes it feel as if you're walking in the church. You can explore it at your own pace, at your own time, rosaryshrine.co.uk. And if you explore the church, you'll see it's a very beautiful church. It's a very, very big church. And people, you know, if you look at a big church or a big house, you think, oh, they must be rich. But of course, no, it means that rich people in the past gave us a very big building and paid for all this, but it all has to be maintained. So the bigger your church, the higher my maintenance costs, the higher the heating costs, and so on and so forth. And my current need and the need of my congregation is to raise money to improve and to, uh, our heating system so that it is safer and more energy efficient. Uh, and that is a pressing concern because the old system is becoming obsolete and it's not safe, um, not as safe as we would like it to be because it's uh, gas fire right under the wooden roof. So fire plus wood generally is not a good combination. We saw what happened at Notre Dame in Paris. So uh, we need to try and get an underfloor heating in place. And because it's a huge church like that, we're looking at a bill of about 150,000 pounds. So with the kind of deficits that we run, it's quite difficult to do that. So all my work uh, promoting the rosary and any love offerings I receive uh, goes towards the needs of the church. It doesn't put any food in my belly, I can assure you of that. So thank you very much anyway for your time. Thank you for allowing me to talk to you about these practicalities. And without any more uh, further ado about these things, let's just uh, begin our talk today. Thank you, Father. That is so, so enlightening. Thank you. So I'm going to go back now to talk about our friend, St. Louis-Marie de Montfort. He was ordained in 1700, 
And so he ministered in France in a very difficult time for Catholics. The intellectual uh, mood and the social mood at the time was rationalistic and therefore anti-devotional, prone to scientism, which means uh, it's the kind of thing that we have today. Things have to be proven by empirical sciences. And there's also an anti-clerical mood in France. And the rest of Europe underwent a so-called age of enlightenment but what I call the endarkening, in fact, a darkening of the mind. Because with this rejection of the spiritual and the supernatural, that means anything beyond the natural sciences, 18th century rationalism and humanism was yet another outbreak, in fact, of the recurring sickness of dualism that I mentioned right at the beginning in the first session. Dualism is a problem that has been with us again and again and again from the very beginning. Saint Dominic in his own time in 13th century France had combated the Albigensian variety of dualism. You might remember I mentioned the name Albigensianism right at the beginning. Let me remind you, the dualistic heresy divides matter, that is um, physical things from spirit. And so it tries to divide the human person. The human person is this unique combination of body and a rational soul and if you try and divide it, it leads to death, okay? Those who are dualist must also then reject Christ and his church because when God becomes man, when God becomes man, this affirms the goodness. God does this to affirm the goodness of the physical, the body, matter. He, he affirms all this and he affirms the spiritual. God comes to unite rather than to divide. Whereas dualism we see is about division, it's about polarization, and that's ever been the modus operandi of the enemy. Satan is the one who wants to divide. And so if we're, intent, if we're attentive to our times, we will see that the ancient serpent of dualism is still at work trying to divide our human societies Whenever you see people trying to shut down conversation and debate, rational thought, okay, and they're relying on emotions only, this kind of thing is the work of Satan. But God has, as always, in his goodness and his mercy, he has provided an antidote. Because of his incarnation, through his incarnation, Christ himself is the, is the cure to all of our illnesses, including the final illness, the final malady, which is death. In death, man is mysteriously separated in body and soul. And the sorrow of pain and, and the sorrow and the pain of death is found in that separation of body and soul, tearing apart the union of body and soul that is fundamental to our human nature. That's why it's experienced as a deep sorrow and suffering. But in response to this, which is the fruit of sin and of Satan's temptation, the risen Christ comes to reunite mortal man through the promise of the resurrection of the body, right? That's why in the incarnation of God made man and by his death and resurrection and ascension into heaven, God has come to mend the breach, to heal our nature, our human nature wounded by sin, to unite and to restore whatever had been broken and torn apart by sin. Now that's the big meta-narrative, if you like, the huge landscape of salvation history that I want us always to keep in mind when we think about the mysteries of the rosary and what the rosary is about. Now in his book, Mysteries, uh, Secrets of the Rosary, this is the second book, the second great bestseller of St. Louis Marie de Montfort. Last week, uh, previously, we talked about True Devotion to Mary. That's his great first bestseller. The second bestseller is called Secrets of the Rosary. Now, in that book, St. Louis Marie de Montfort recounts that in 1214, Our Lady appeared to St. Dominic, and she said to him, Dear Dominic, do you know which weapon the Blessed Trinity wants to use to reform the world? And he replies, my lady, you know far better than I do, because next to your son, Jesus Christ, you have always been the chief instrument of our salvation, the chief instrument of our salvation. To which the mother of God says, 
I want you to know that in this kind of warfare, the battering ram has always been the angelic psalter, which is the foundation of the new foundation stone of the New Testament. Therefore, if you want to reach these hardened souls and win them over to God, preach my psalter. Now, at the time, in 1214, the name rosary wasn't used yet. Now, I'm just recapping on some things I said right at the very beginning of our sessions in session one. The rosary wasn't known yet, but the Christian practice of praying with beads, saying at first 150 our fathers, this practice went back to the fourth century Egyptian desert fathers. And then in the Middle Ages, shortly before the time of St. Dominic, the pious custom arose among the laity of saying 150 Hail Marys instead of the Our Fathers. And this is what they called the angelic Psalter. Why is it called that? Angelic, because it consists of the angel's salutation to Mary, her, the angel's greeting. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. And it's called the Psalter because it was said 150 times in imitation of the 150 Psalms that are in the Bible. And then in 1214, St. Dominic has shown a particular way of praying the angelic Psalter by dividing those 150 Hail Marys into sets of 10 and then combining those prayers with meditation on the mysteries of our salvation. So as St. Louis Marie de Montfort concludes, God wished by means of these supernatural phenomena to spread the new devotion of the Holy Rosary and to make it more widely known. Hence the Rosary, as this devotion given by Our Lady to St. Dominic came to be called, has a particular emphasis on praying with body and soul. Vocal prayer, so speaking aloud, or at least in our mind, the prayers of the Hail Mary and the Our Father and the Glory Be. And then mental prayer. Mental prayer means uh, in your mind, seeing uh, the mysteries of salvation, a particular element, a uh, particular scene from the life of Christ, okay? And then the fingers moving along the beads, okay, moving with the beads and the lips speaking the words and the eyes perhaps engaged by a sacred image. All these are the ways in which the mind and the spirit, body and soul is completely taken up in prayer, okay? In this unitive way of prayer, so that the whole human person, body and soul is involved, we hold, at, we hold a, at bay the heresy of dualism. Because our human weakness means that we have a tendency to drift towards one extreme or the other, right? It's all bodily or it's all completely mental and spiritual. And we want to have a combination of both. The mass is like that too. Think, for example, that when you go to mass and, uh, you know, your whole body is involved when you sit, kneel, stand, and we walk in processions as well, and we're praying and we're thinking uh, of what Christ has done for us. All this is a whole body experience. It's even better when we have, you know, incense and so on in use, because then our, our senses are all involved. So prayer is a bodily experience for us Catholics. And for St. Dominic, uh, he has a beautiful book called The Nine Ways of Prayer of St. Dominic. And many of his different ways of prayer, only one of them is sitting and reading the scriptures, but the rest, he's always walking, moving, kneeling, standing, raising his hands. All these are different ways of praying for a saint like St. Dominic. As a result, many people, many people find the rosary especially especially hard to do well, because we have this tendency to veer towards one extreme or the other, or to becoming, of course, distracted. Uh, our mind wanders or our body distracts us, right? How to concentrate on the words while also focusing on the meditation of the mystery. When I began as a Catholic and tried to pray the rosary, this was the thing that always troubled me. How to do both? And I found it really difficult. And therefore I hate, you know, really didn't like saying the rosary. Even St. Louis Marie de Montfort admitted, he said, the rosary is the hardest prayer to say well and to persevere in, owing especially to the distractions, 
which almost inevitably attend the constant repetition of the same words. St. Louis-Marie de Montfort, the great promoter and preacher of the rosary, admits that he finds it difficult, just as all of us know. We find it difficult too. But as we shall see later on, he and many other saints and popes encourage us to persevere and not to be tempted by the devil to give up because of our own weaknesses. And then I will offer you then some tips on the sensible advice on prayer given by St. Thomas Aquinas, the great doctor of the church, the great teacher of the Dominican order. The Holy Rosary, with its clear focus on the mysteries of Christ's incarnation, passion, death, resurrection, and ascension into glory, is concentrated then on preaching and meditating upon God's cure for our human sadnesses, his antidote for our sinful dualistic tendencies and temptations, his protection from all that would darken the human mind and soul, the rosary is his vaccine from the lies of Satan, the poison of Satan. Every bead of the rosary, therefore, every bead is, if you think about it, like a pill that we take to thus be healed and made whole by the saving grace of Jesus Christ and by his gospel of salvation. Now, I just want to quickly attend to one thing. I'm often asked, as promoter general of the rosary, what I think about the luminous mysteries. As you know, I've been talking about the Dominican rosary, the classic rosary, which is joyful, sorrowful, and glorious mysteries. And people ask me, what about the luminous mysteries? Do I pray them? Do we have to pray them? Do we have to accept them? And all that kind of questions, okay? Well, let's look at what the Pope, uh, John Paul II actually said. St. John Paul II said that he never said that we have to pray the Luminous Mysteries, but in his letter, Rosarium Virginis Mariae, he says that he hoped that the Mysteries of Light would enable the Rosary to become more fully a compendium of the Gospel. But he always said respectfully that this was an option, and he introduced it as an option. You can choose, you are free to choose whether or not you want to pray the Luminous Mysteries, okay? But I respectfully say that the goal of presenting a compendium of the gospel, if you like a kind of um, all the events of the gospel put together for our meditation, this goal is different from the aim of St. Dominic and of the Dominican order. Because as the Dominican teacher of St. John Paul II, Father Garrigou Lagrange put it, he said, our blessed lady made known to St. Dominic, a kind of preaching till then unknown, which she said would be one of the most powerful weapons against future errors and in future difficulties. Under her inspiration, St. Dominic went into the villages of the heretics, gathered the people and preached to them the mysteries of salvation, the incarnation, the redemption, eternal life, the mysteries of salvation. So when we pray the rosary, we're not being called, according to our Dominican tradition, we're not being called just to meditate on scenes in the life of Christ or to focus on what Jesus did during his lifetime as though the rosary is a kind of biologic, biographical newsreel or kind of movie, you know, we kind of watch one scene after the other in his life. No, we are being called to meditate on the mysteries of salvation. We're being called to ponder theologically what the second person of the most holy trinity accomplished through his incarnation and his paschal mystery. And what did he accomplish for us? The great saint doctor of the church Athanasius summed it up in this little statement. God became man so that man might become God. Let me repeat that. God became man so that man might become God. That is, in a nutshell, what the Christianity is about. If someone asks you, why are you a Christian? What is Christianity about? Please, please remember this. God became man so that man might become God. 
only Christianity dares to say something as audacious as this. And this great mystery of God becoming man so that man might become God is the focus of the mysteries of the rosary. And that's why we have what I call a triptych of the joyful, the sorrowful and the glorious mysteries. God becoming man, then his passion death, that's how he saves us. And then man becoming God as we are caught up, filled with the grace of Christ, redeemed by him and caught up in that movement of Christ, his, his, his resurrection, his ascension, and then going right up to the coronation in heaven of Our Lady and all the saints. That is the pattern, God becoming man so that man might become God. So the joyful, sorrowful and glorious mysteries of the rosary admirably and sufficiently and succinctly are focused on the gospel of salvation. And this is not surprising, given that the emphasis of the order of the Dominican order is on preaching the gospel for the salvation of souls. You can see why the Dominican Rosary complements our mission so well, because it encapsulates, it encapsulates in a very succinct manner this beautiful mystery of our salvation, of God becoming man, so that man might become God. This doesn't mean that we cannot preach the luminous mysteries or pray them. But if we think about it, and if you read my book, Mysteries Made Visible, I lay it out very clearly, I hope, or I think I lay it out clearly, the mysteries of light refer to the sacramental life of the church, the sacramental life of the church. And this is important because it is through the sacraments, principally through the sacraments, that we who are baptized into Christ participate in the mysteries of Christ, in the mysteries of salvation, and that we are sanctified by Christ, okay? So we have the central mysteries of salvation, God becoming man so that man might become God. How does man become God? How are we divinized? How are we sanctified? How are we filled with grace? Through the sacraments. And that's why Pope St. Leo the Great said, what was visible in our savior has passed over into his mysteries. That means into his sacraments. This is a time now in our age, in this time, when we need to rediscover again the great and indispensable value of the sacraments. And that's why I believe Providence led Pope St. John Paul II to introduce the luminous mysteries. The mistake is that people have not been thinking about them sacramentally, have not been thinking about these mysteries as revealing and disclosing the sacraments as the source of salvation by giving us grace from God grace that flows from the paschal mystery of Jesus Christ. But if you read our catechism, if we know our theology, it's very obvious. The luminous mysteries of the rosary introduced by Pope St. John Paul II are about the sacramental life of the church, about how we live in the church and receive grace from the body of Christ, the church. Okay, that's enough about the luminous mysteries. Now let's talk about the practicalities because I know that uh, being Malaysians, you want me to get practical with you. Enough about all this theology and abstract stuff, right? Right. So for the rest of the talk, I want to summarize some of St. Louis-Marie de Montfort's teaching on the practice of the rosary. There is no doubt that the rosary is a sublime instrument for our conversion and our salvation. And St. Louis-Marie de Montfort lists many fruits and miraculous conversions and miracles worked by the rosary. But I want to just draw attention to this statement of the saint. He said, the Holy Rosary teaches people about the virtues of Jesus and Mary and leads them to mental prayer and to imitate our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It teaches them to approach the sacraments often, to genuinely strive after Christian virtues and to do all kinds of good works, as well as interesting them in the wonderful indulgences which can be gained through the rosary. I already mentioned indulgences last week in the question session. Uh, and then he goes on to say, if you say the rosary faithfully until death, I do assure you that in spite of the gravity of your sins, you shall receive a never fading crown of glory. Even if you are on the brink of damnation, 
even if you have one foot in hell, even if, if you have sold your soul to the devil as sorcerers do who, who practice black magic, and even if you are a heretic as obstinate as a devil, sooner or later, you will be converted and you will amend your life and save your soul if, and mark well what I say, if you say the Holy Rosary devoutly every day until death for the purpose of knowing the truth and obtaining contrition and pardon for your sins. Now, all these provisos are extremely important, okay? If you say it devoutly every day, the rosary, for the purpose of knowing the truth and obtaining contrition and pardon for your sins, okay? So please don't tell me and don't misunderstand and say, oh, St. Louis Marie de Montfort says that if we pray the rosary, we can be as awful as the devil and we'll, we'll be saved. No, he didn't say that. You got to pray the rosary devoutly for the purpose of obtaining contrition and pardon for your sins. Contrition means repentance of sins, right? And to this end, I just want to point out the example. You can look him up later on. Blessed Bartolo Longo of Pompeii, famous uh, promoter of the rosary. He built the Basilica of the Holy Rosary in Pompeii. He had been a priest of Satan but he was rescued from suicidal thoughts and from his satanic ways by the Holy Rosary. And that's why he became a great promoter of the Rosary. Now, there are many other such stories and miracles of the Rosary, which you can find in St. Louis Marie de Montfort's book, Secrets of the Rosary, uh, and also in a more recent book, Champions of the Rosary by my friend, Father Donald Calloway. I recommend both those books to you. One is written by a saint, the other one written, I hope, by a future saint. Okay, and if you want to look at technicalities of praying the rosary, for example, people always ask me, how do I start the rosary? Do I need to say the creed? What if I don't say the creed? All this kind of stuff. Um, you need to go and read Rosarium Virginis Mariae. That's the encyclical written by Pope St. John Paul II, all about the rosary. And in chapter three of his encyclical, he has lots of wonderful observations coming from the Pope about how to pray the rosary and how to start and how to end. In short, whether or not you have the creed at the beginning, there are two different customs. Some people have it. Others, like the Dominicans, like the Legion of Mary, they don't have the creed. They just begin like we begin the divine office. Oh God, come to our aid. All right? And so on and so forth. Both are acceptable. Both are fine. Now, how then do we pray the rosary? And I mean pray, not say the rosary. How do we pray the rosary? Now, St. Louis Marie de Montfort says, one single Hail Mary that is said properly is worth more than 150 that are badly said. One single Hail Mary properly said is worth more than 150 badly said. Most Catholics say the rosary, either the whole 15 mysteries or five of them anyway, or at least a few decades. But why is it then that so few of them give up their sins and go forward in the spiritual life? Surely it must be because they are not saying them as they should. It is a good thing then that we think over how we pray if we really want to please God and want to become more holy. Before we continue then, I'm going to remind you again, I'm going to review, what is the point of prayer and what is prayer anyway? The principal focus of prayer, according to the teaching of St. Thomas Aquinas, the common doctor of the church, the principal focus of prayer is to provoke love for God, is to stir up a love for God. He says, since nothing can provoke love more than to know that one is loved, so it seems to me that by meditating on the mystery, we first of all think about and recall and bring to mind how much God loves us. See what God has done for us in becoming man. Session two and session three of these series have been principally about theological matters so that we can think theologically, rationally, intelligently based on the Bible of what God has done for us. God has become man so that man might become God. Why does he want us to become 
divine, because only then, only then, can we truly be uh, living in heaven with him. God wants us to be with him, to be united with him through love. And he wants us to be to share in intimate friendship with him. That is the goal. God loves us so much that he's done all this for us. So it is by meditating on the rosary, meditating on what God has done to show his love for us and to enable us to become like him, that we can then really love God more, be stirred up to love God more. And one of the great English Dominicans, uh, Father B. Jarrett, summed up St. Thomas Aquinas' teaching of prayer through this simple phrase, this simple sentence. He said, remember this, prayer is lifting up, not pulling down. Prayer is not pulling God down to my will. It is lifting my will up to God. That is prayer. Prayer is not to make God agree with me, but to make me agree with God's dealings with me. Let me say that one more time. Prayer is lifting up, not pulling down. It is not pulling God down to my will. It is lifting my will up to God. That is prayer. It is not to make God agree with me, but to make me agree with God's dealings with me. In his question on prayer, in the Summa Theologiae, that's the great work of St. Thomas Aquinas. St. Thomas recalls that the object of prayer, the object of our prayer is God and our final beatitude, that means our final happiness. And he says that we are to pray for those things which therefore enable us to merit heaven so that we can have that final happiness of being with God forever in heaven. That is the object of prayer praying that we might enjoy the sight and the company and the vision of God in heaven. That's the object of prayer, St. Thomas says. Temporal goods, that means things of this world, the material world, temporal goods are subjected to this end. So you've got the great goal of heaven and everything else falls beneath that as long as it's directed towards the final end. But temporal things, earthly things, worldly things are not to become ends in themselves. Okay. However, in Article 14 of that question in the Summa, I was struck by St. Thomas's wise counsel concerning the duration of our prayers. How long should we pray for? You know, should we pray all night? Should we keep a vigil? St. Thomas says, it is becoming that prayer should last long enough to arouse the fervor of the interior desire. And when it exceeds this measure, so that it cannot be continued any longer without causing weariness, it should be discontinued. So pray long enough so as to arouse your love for God, your desire for heaven. But if you go beyond that, so that it becomes wearisome, tiring, tedious even, it should be discontinued, okay? Now the rosary, it seems to me, is well suited to this kind of praying because it means that we could, it is quite possible that we pray just one decade at a time. St. Louis Marie de Montfort therefore says this, I advise you to divide up your rosary into three parts and to say each group of mysteries, that means five decades, at a different time of day. This is much better than saying the whole 15 decades all at once. But if you cannot find the time to say a third part of the rosary all at one time, say it gradually, a decade here and a decade there. I'm sure you can manage this, says St. Louis-Marie de Montfort, so that in spite of your work and all the calls upon your time, you will have said the whole rosary before going to bed. A decade here and a decade there, okay? Pope Benedict XVI once indicated that this is how he prayed the rosary. And it gave me great consolation because I used to think if I cannot say at least five decades in one sitting, then uh, you know, what's the point of trying? 
but one decade here and there makes a lot of sense to me. It's preferable surely to say one decade well, consciously and mindfully, than to rush through five decades in one sitting. Just as it's better to say one Hail Mary well than 150 Hail Marys poorly said, right? Again, St. Thomas Aquinas gives us wise and humane counsel about distractions in prayer. Now, it's not uncommon to be distracted, for example, during uh, prayer, during adoration, during times of um, saying the divine office for me as a priest, okay? And so St. Thomas, when he talks about distractions in prayer, considers firstly our human nature. Remember, human beings are a combination, this unique uh, unit of body and soul, body and soul. Angels are pure spirit, by the way. They don't have bodies, so they're not distracted by their bodies when they're in adoration of the Lord. We, however, have bodies. We can hear things. We see things. We smell things. All this can help to distract us, and our body gets, you know, we start to itch and so on and so forth. Um, sitting in Singapore, I used to remember as a, as a teenager, in a hot, humid church, it was very distracting. I found it very hard to pray when I can feel the sweat dripping down my back. So bodies can be distracting. But St. Thomas Aquinas says this, the human mind is unable to remain aloft, meaning remain lifted up in prayer for long, because human weakness weighs down the soul to the level of inferior things, inferior things meaning more bodily things. So he says that in order for prayer to stir us up to a greater love for prayer, for God, that means in order for the goal of our prayer to be met, he says, it is not necessary, it is not necessary that prayer should be attentive throughout, okay? It's not necessary that our prayer be attentive throughout for the whole period. But what is necessary, St. Thomas Aquinas says, is that it should be begun well, meaning when we begin to pray, when we set out to pray, we are mindful of having the proper intention of offering to God our love, our attention, our needs. We come before the Lord as his loving children because we love him. That desire to pray is how we begin prayer well. We don't come before God because we're superstitious, because we're fearful, because oh, if I don't say my novena, or I don't say my rosary, I'm going to be damned or cursed or whatever. That's not the way to pray. We come to God wanting to love him and to discover more of his love. It was St. Teresa of Avila who said, prayer is the simplest thing because it is spending time with the one that we love and the one who loves us so much, right? So that desire to love and to grow in love is how we begin our prayer. And then he says, St. Thomas Aquinas says, to wander in mind unintentionally, unintentionally, does not deprive prayer of his fruit. Hence, St. Basil says, if you are so truly weakened by the effects of original sin that you are unable to pray attentively, strive as much as you can to curb yourself and God will pardon you. Seeing that you are unable to stand in his presence in a becoming manner, not through negligence, but through frailty through weakness. One of the benefits I find of praying the rosary with art, and that's what we're going to talk about next week, is that with art, such as uh, I find in the rosary shrine here in London, I can concentrate on these beautifully carved altarpieces depicting each of the 15 mysteries of the rosary. And that way I find that if my mind starts to wander, my eyes, what I'm looking at, leads me back to focus on the mystery of salvation. Personally, I've also found the method of saying a decade at a time to be useful. And what I would recommend is doing it this way, okay? Of course, I have the rosary uh, hanging here by my side, okay? Which makes it possible for me easily to reach out to my rosary at any time of the day. But everybody should either wear a rosary ring maybe or keep a rosary, a small lightweight rosary in your pockets so that carry the rosary with you at all times. 
And that way you can begin the day with a decade, end the day with a decade, and then throughout the, the rest of the day, add a decade here and a decade there. Maybe for example, after spending some time online or looking at social media, you might have many things to pray about. Pause, say a prayer. For me, while traveling on the bus during the day, I can pray the rosary. Whilst I'm waiting for the bus to come or the tube to arrive, I can pray the rosary. Walking through the streets, walking to the supermarket or wherever it is, walking to a parishioner's house, I will pray the rosary. When I sit in the confessional, waiting for people to come, I pray the rosary, right? Having the rosary with you means that you can pray a decade at a time. St. Louis Marie de Montfort was often seen walking with the rosary in his hands. And I have no doubt that this is how the Dominican friars who walked the length and breadth of the European continent as itinerant preachers traveled with the rosary in hand, praying and meditating on the mysteries of salvation all the time as they went. And so before I work on a talk, before I give a lecture, before I start a meeting, if I wait for someone to come, I would start saying the rosary, just a decade during the day. If I do this conscientiously throughout the day, I find that by the end of the day, I've often said 15 decades of the rosary or at the very least, at the very, very least, five decades. That's what I set myself up as the minimum. I do five decades a day, but if I keep doing it like this, often it goes up to 15, okay? And that's how we can make, uh, we can be, make the whole day a day of prayer. Remember the scriptures tell us to pray at all times, or the Lord says, be vigilant at all times, praying that you may have strength. We need God's strength. We need God's grace throughout the day, don't we? With all its challenges and all its struggles. So let us pray the rosary throughout the day. And in this way, we can be strengthened by the grace of God. This practice of praying the rosary wherever we, uh, throughout the day means that we can pray the rosary whether we're sitting or walking or even lying down. As some people have asked me, can I pray it lying down? Well, yes, I don't see it as disrespectful as long as your intention is correct. And you can be working in the garden. You could be, um, you could be beating eggs. Um, any form of work can be brought up in prayer. Okay. Now, it's probably harder to say the rosary while you're driving, unless perhaps you're listening to a recording or you hear it live on the radio and you can pray the rosary with the people who are praying there, okay? I mean, I often have driven up and down the length and breadth of the USA with other Dominicans and the Dominican who's driving will often say, let's pray the rosary. And I say, it, uh, I, I lead the rosary. In fact, the rosary is the best thing you can pray in a way whilst you're driving with someone else because you know the other person is counting the beads for you and you can just respond. And, and we've done this as Dominican friars quite a lot when we're driving. Okay, so it's just a matter of how we do it. You can do it in a very recollected way and it can be done slowly. Now, some people might object and say to me, well, shouldn't we say the rosary when we're kneeling? Yes, St. Louis Marie de Montfort says that the rosary ought to be said as far as possible kneeling with the hands joined and clasping the rosary. But he goes on to say, however, if people are ill, they can of course say it in bed or if they are traveling, it can be said on foot. And if infirmity prevents people kneeling, it can be said seating or seated or standing. The rosaries, he said, can even be said at work if people's daily duties keep them at their jobs, because the work of one's hands is not by any means always incompatible with vocal prayer. Of course, since the soul has its limitations and can only do so much, when we are concentrating on manual work, we cannot give our undivided attention to things of the spirit, such as prayer. But when we cannot do otherwise, this kind of prayer is not without value in Our Lady's eyes, and she rewards our goodwill more than our external actions. Did you all hear that? Okay. So, even when we're doing manual work, it's true that we cannot give our undivided attention to this. Just think, for example, of mothers carrying their babies, feeding their babies. It's busy being a mother, it's, but the intention, that desire to pray, to love God, and to seek the love of God, this 
St. Louis Marie de Montfort says, this kind of prayer is not without value in Our Lady's eyes, and she rewards our goodwill more than our external actions. All right? So just bear that in mind. It's important to remember this. Your intention in prayer is really, really important. And remember what we're seeking. We're seeking love with God. We're seeking a greater love of God to stir up a greater desire for God and for heaven. That's the object of prayer. Now, in saying all this, I think St. Louis Marie de Montfort is just echoing the very sensible approach of St. Thomas Aquinas when he tells us that we, when we pray, it is not through negligence that we're distracted, but through our human frailty, the limitations of our human bodies, of our human souls, as St. Louis Marie de Montfort puts it. Okay. And what happens if we're distracted during prayer and then we become aware of that distraction? St. Louis refers to distractions in prayer as flies and ants. <laughs> and these, he says, should be brushed away. And then we refocus and try our best to persevere with the rosary. He writes, do not listen to the devil, but be of good heart, even if your imagination has been bothering you throughout your rosary, filling your mind with all kinds of distracting thoughts. As long as you really tried hard to get rid of them as soon as they came, always remember that the best rosary is the one with the most merit, and there is more merit in praying when it is hard than when it is easy. Okay? The best rosary is the one with the most merit, and there is more merit in praying when it is hard than when it is easy. That means you really try to push through all those distractions, try and brush them aside and go and carry on and persevere. We should beware then of the temptation to think of prayer like a task that we must succeed in. Because if we do, the tendency is that pride keeps us from attempting the rosary. If I cannot say this well, then I'm not gonna say it. That was very much my attitude. If I can't do this perfectly, then I don't want to try, or I find it too hard. I find it too defeating. It defeats me. But St. Louis warns us, this is a devil's trickery. The devil wants to stop us from praying, and he especially wants us to stop praying the rosary. Or perhaps you're a high achiever, as so many Singaporeans must be. They're told to be. Right? You live in a society which values success and results and accomplishments. And you want to see, what are the accomplishments of my prayer? Am I a good prayer? Can I make things happen with my prayer? Right? If so, watch out. Watch out against this tendency to turn prayer into a task with methods and tips for success to bring about desired results. Remember, Prayer is lifting up, not pulling down. It is not pulling God down to my will. It is lifting my will up to God. It is not to make God agree with me, but to make me agree with God's dealings with me. In fact, Father B. Jarrett, who said all that, he goes on, he warns us against prayer that is reduced to hard and fast rules. A prayer, he said, that can be so mapped out and so regimented that it hardly seems at all to be a language of the heart. Prayer is the language of the heart because prayer is about loving God and receiving the love of God. And when that happens, when your prayer becomes mapped out and regimented and scrupulous, must I say this, must I do this, must it be this way? All this regimented prayer, when this happens, Father B. Jarrett says, all adventure is gone, all the personal touches and all the contemplation. We are too worried and harassed to think of God. The instructions are so detailed and insistent that we forget what we are trying to learn. As a consequence, we become bored, and so no doubt does God. Prayer that is regimented and heartless is boring and we forget what we're trying to learn. What are we trying to learn? Right at the beginning, I said, we're trying to learn the virtues of Christ. 
which is to love God as the Son of God loves his Father. Therefore, when speaking of the, about the rosary, I often try to avoid setting down too many guidelines that make it too regimented. Many people ask me if they must do this or they must do that, if they're doing it right. And I just reply, to pray well is to stir up a greater love for God. And to do it with merit is to pray when it is hard, not when it's easy. St. Thomas Aquinas says, with even greater wisdom than me, of course, he says, all that stuff that I said earlier, that we should pray in order to arouse our interior desire. And when it goes on for too long, so that it causes weariness, it should be discontinued. So again, as I said, we can use music, sacred art, we should read scripture, reflect from the saints and so on, all this to help focus our minds for a time, to invite us to reflect. But I am wary about too many devotions or innovations that encourage us to say so many rosaries in a day that they risk becoming superstitious or unreflective. Let us remember the observation of St. Louis-Marie de Montfort. A decade that you say without recollection, that, sorry, a decade that you say with recollection, that means with a uh, sort of meditation, will be worth more than thousands of rosaries said all in a rush without any pauses or reflection. I think someone asked me at one point uh, in the last few, in the last week or so about, you know, is it okay that he's a bit dissatisfied when rosaries are prayed really fast in his parish? And, and my response to that is, you know, if it is too quick and it's not really helping you to grow in devotion, then don't go, don't go, okay? A final thought. St. Louis Marie de Montfort encourages the praying of the rosary in a group whenever possible. And one of the ways that the rosary confraternity does this, for example, is to encourage a monthly procession. Our rosary processions every month here in the Rosary Shrine in London are extremely popular uh, with candlelight, with a bit of singing and with movement as we move around the church. This way, the whole body and soul is engaged in praying the rosary. And beauty is an important part of helping us to pray. St. Louis Marie de Montfort says, there are several ways of praying the, the whole, of saying the Holy Rosary, but that which gives Almighty God the greatest glory, does the most for our souls, and which the devil fears more than any other, is that of saying or chanting the Rosary publicly in two sections. It reminds us of the Lord's promise that where two or three are gathered in his name, he is present. And so to pray the rosary together with others places our prayer in the presence of Christ. Moreover, he says that a group of Christians praying together is like an army ranged against the devil. And so we are stronger together. We gain the merits of the whole group and together we have the victory over temptation and sin. And this is the reason why the rosary confraternity is so very powerful because one of the um, principle, the founding principle to the Rosary Confraternity is that if you're a member of the Confraternity of the Holy Rosary, whenever you pray, wherever you may be, wherever in the world, you are united as a group, as an army of prayer against the, the attacks of the devil, okay? And this brings me to my final point, which concerns, which concerns obstacles to a fruitful praying of the Holy Rosary. The Rosary, as I have said, brings down innumerable graces. It makes us sharers in the merits of the Dominican saints if we're in the confraternity. But only a soul that is in friendship with God, that is to say, one who is not in a state of mortal sin, can actually benefit from these graces. Because medicine of you can only help the sick and the injured, but it cannot help the dead. So if we are spiritually dead through mortal sin, then no amount of medicine can help us, right? Rather, what we need if we are spiritually dead is resurrection. And that is what confession is. The sacrament of confession applies the power of the risen Lord to our souls to raise us from the dead to new life in Christ so that we can once more benefit from the medicine of the sacraments like the Eucharist and of the 
Holy Rosary and all the other graces. This is why St. Louis Marie de Montfort says, to say the Holy Rosary to advantage, one must be in a state of grace, or at the very least be fully determined to give up mortal sin. This we know because all our theology teaches us that good works and prayers are only dead works if they are done in a state of mortal sin. We earnestly beg everyone to say the Holy Rosary, the just that they may persevere and grow in God's grace, the sinners that they may rise from their sins. But God forbid that we should ever encourage a sinner to think that Our Lady will protect him with her mantle if he continues to love sin, for then it will only turn into a mantle of damnation which will hide his, uh, his sins from the public eye. So my brothers and sisters, I beg of you, if you haven't done so recently, if you don't, if you're not in the practice of doing so, please examine your conscience, be humble and contrite and go to confession. The sacraments are of far greater importance than any number of devotions, any kind of chaplet, any kind of rosary. The sacraments are the source and summit of our life. They are what make us united to Christ. They sanctify us, they divinize us. They are the means by which man can become God. So please let us focus on the right things. Our focus is that we grow in friendship with Jesus and that is through loving him more and more. And as Jesus says, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you very much, Father. Um, I think there are a couple of questions in the chat. Um, can I ask that um, we address those? And then while you want to ask any questions, if you put your hand up and then I will uh, unmute you. So I think there's one question, uh, Father, from Joanna, which was directed to me. Um, and she asks for any tips to pray the rosary with teenagers and how do we help them to uh, develop a love to pray the rosary? Um, we were going to talk about praying with children, families, teenagers, blah, 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 uh, next week. Um, okay. So I don't want to answer that now because then we won't have anything to talk about next week. <laughs> okay, there we go. That's that question. Um, I think there's one from Justin um, Father. Um, yes. How do we join the Rosary Confraternity and what does it mean to do so? Um, I think I mentioned this in the first session, but to be enrolled in the Rosary Confraternity, you should approach the Dominicans in the territory closest to you, which if you're in Malaysia and Singapore, um, I suppose will be, well, if you're in Singapore, you can try reaching the Dominicans there. If not, uh, the Philippines definitely would be the go-to place in Asia. Uh, and you ask to be enrolled. Uh, you can often do this by looking up online and doing it uh, by email if you don't live in the territory. Um, and you, uh, if you can't find anyone, just get in touch with me um, and you're enrolled in the confraternity. You just manifest your desire to join and that means you're a member. And the only requirement is to say 15 decades of the rosary every week. Uh, and you do that praying for the intentions of the confraternity. So if you already say the rosary, uh, many of you I'm sure say five decades a day at least, or you try to, then you know if you're doing that already, then you already qualify. So you might as well be enrolled. Great. Okay, we've got um, Hilda D'Souza who's going to ask you a question. Thank you, Hilda. Hello, Father. Good evening. Thank you for the beautiful talk. It's Thank really you. helping us more and more to understand more about the rosary. Now, I wanted to know, do we meditate on the mysteries that we say, or also can we meditate just on the, on the, on the Our Father, Hail Mary, and the Holy Mary? Um, than the mystery by itself, yeah. You know what I'm saying, Father? 
Yeah, I do. Well, okay. in a way, I think that <laughs> you know th there isn't there isn't a divergence between the prayers that Jesus taught us and the Hail Mary. Mm. Um, they all should converge on the same thing. Even the mysteries of our salvation all converge on the same thing, which is that we should marvel at the various means in which God reveals His love for us. Um, and I think that um, occasionally it would be fine and, and, and desirable that we meditate on the words of the Our Father and of the Hail Mary and so on. Mm. Um, but the rosary is split up into these particular mysteries mm. because our attention needs to be, our human attentions are weak. So we kind of focus on all kinds of things. Mm. And sometimes it helps, it, it's a discipline to focus us in on, mm. let's say for example, uh, Christ carrying the cross, mm. right? Mm. And it focuses on us on that so that we can think more in a more concentrated way or what it means for Jesus to carry the wood of the cross, the weight of the cross, the mm -hmm. burden of the cross. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. And it's got to do, of course, with the burden of our sins, but it's also got to do with perseverance. So we all have to carry our crosses. Mm -hmm. And we can think about how, you know, we need to carry our cross, but with the help of Jesus, who also carried his cross, uh, we can uh, persevere. Mm -hmm. And you can just imagine that someone might have a very difficult time at the moment in his life, and helping praying the rosary that way can really help to concentrate him, uh, concentrate his mind on his current day problems mm -hmm. and be encouraged by our Lord who's carrying the cross with him. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. That's how I mean by meditating on the rosary and applying it to your life today. Okay. Okay. Because I tend to go in and out. Like, for example, I'm thinking and concentrating on the, the, like the crucifixion. And then you concentrate on Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. And you know, you, then you go away from that and then you come into the Hail Mary and you yeah. concentrate and think of, meditate on Our Lady, you know? So yes. that's, that's the, the question. Thank you, Father. Okay, thank you. Father, there is one which is asking, is the Legion of Mary uh, a confraternity? No, the Legion of Mary is, uh, don't you have Legion of Mary in your parishes? Uh, <laughs> the Legion of Mary is uh, was founded 101 years ago in Ireland. Uh, it is a group, it is a pious association, a group of people who, um, who are actually meant to be the evangelizing arm of the parish, to be honest. They're meant to go into the streets and visit people in their homes and to speak to them about God and God's love for them. And they're the army of Mary out in the world. Um, that's what they were founded to do. Um, but uh, nowadays it's thought of as just a pious rosary prayer group um, do, who does maybe some few good works, but it is meant to be in a strongly evangelic, uh, evangelizing arm. Um, anyway, all these things are available online. Look it up. It's not a confraternity though. Um, there's one from Rosalind Maguire who asks, Father, could you kindly elaborate the meaning of Mary is our mother in the order of grace? Um, I think I did that last week, right? Mm. Watch the recording. Have you got any other questions that you'd like to ask Father from anyone? Oh, okay. Hilda's putting her hand up again. Hang on. Um. Oh, no, I'm just going to, Father, sorry, one more question. I know you said we are going to pray with the pictures, yeah? You said next week. Would yes. you, I'm going to ask in advance and I dare to ask, would we be able to get those pictures as well for us? Uh, yeah. Yeah, oh, beautiful. Yeah. Thank you, Father. Thank okay. you. Yes, but I think, I suppose, um, if, if the, I mean, the talks are all recorded, and yeah. if I share my screen, oh, okay. you know, you can watch it again, right? So right, sure, sure. And I mean, will we be going through all the all the four of them? No, not necessary. I think, I mean, given the amount of questions that people ask, and given how limited time is, yeah. uh, I think one decade is about all we're going to manage. Yeah. Okay. All right. We'll see how we go, Father. Thank yeah. you. 
Thank you. I mean, uh, to be perfectly honest, um, you know, many people ask me many questions and they, um, you know, we can revisit this at some other point in time, God yeah. willing, you know, we're, I'm going to be alive still and you're going to be alive. So this is not your last chance to ask every single question on the rosary and Our Lady and on the Catholic faith that you ever wanted to ask. Yeah. So, you know, yes. we can do what we can do in the times given to us. Sure, no problem. Thank you, Father. Okay. Okay, we've got Julian. Um, I think it's this Julian. Julian, would you like to switch on your uh, video so that we can see you? Oh, there we go. Oh, Oops. Oh. Okay, you're unmuted now. Speak. Oops, no. Um, there you go. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Okay, I thought I was still muted. Okay, this is a question related to some prayer issues. Now, it might be a bit strange, but this happened like some 15 years back when my relatives heard that there was some prayer said during a storm session. And strangely enough, this was not through some sermon, but some word of mouth that went round. And I'm wondering why this type of news was not given during church session. And they were saying that there was this short prayer to say before or during a thunderstorm, and that's about it. Now, my question is, why were not these issues raised up during church times? Isn't this the appropriate time? And after we heard about this prayer issue, you know, we never heard about it anymore. And for the next 15 years until now, no one has ever talked about it. So my question is, is there such a prayer that you say during a storm? And is it important? I thought that since we are all the time obeying God, doing God's will in whatever ways we can, God should always protect us. It gives me the impression that if we don't say this prayer, we are going to be punished somehow. I mean, that's the impression I'm getting. Thank you. Um, I think that turning prayer into superstition is always a mistake. So if we think, if I don't do this, then why is going to happen it's a bit like you know a chain letter that goes around and chain letters tell you you must say this otherwise you will lose Everyone all your dies. money or you will someone will die all this crap. <laughs> that my friends is what we call superstition which the lord condemns god doesn't condemn superstition because he's angry as such but because it's sad why is he sad because it means that we are fearful and what does he want for us that we not be fearful as as the scriptures tell us perfect love casts out fear Jesus says again and again in the Bible, God says, do not be afraid. And superstition comes from fear. We're afraid that God will punish us. We're afraid that we'll die in a storm. We're afraid that the plane will crash. But why are you afraid? Why are you afraid? Of what are you afraid? If you are a child of God, united to him through grace, which means that the blessed Trinity dwells in your soul, why are you afraid? Jesus says, do not fear those who can harm body and soul, but fear those who can cast your soul into hell. In other words, be afraid of your sins. Fear your sins. Therefore, repent and go to confession. If you are in a state of grace, you have nothing whatsoever to fear. The best prayer you can do is to go to Holy Mass, go to the sacraments, go to confession, and say the Lord's Prayer. And second to that, of course, the Holy Rosary. I've got one from Dorothy. Uh, she says, Father, must the Rosary be said vocally? Can it be said mentally? Yes, it can be said mentally. I mean, otherwise, I, I'll be sitting on the bus and speaking out loud. I think people will be quite annoyed with me. <laughs> All right. Um, let me have a look and see if there's anyone else um on the screens um da, 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 da. right i think that's it father 
Uh, if you've got any other questions that you would like or you're a bit shy, you can always email it in and Father will get to them as soon as he can. So it's now um, 5.23. Oh, Julian's popped his hand up again. Would you be able to answer Julian, Father? Yes. Okay. Okay, go on, Julian. Thank you for the chance. Uh, Father Lawrence, I'd like to clarify that I'm not a very superstitious person, but it's just that we heard about this prayer. We were not told things like what you mentioned just now. Oh, if I don't say this prayer, I'll be punished. No, I'm just wondering whether this prayer exists. And Sorry, I was cut off. I'm just wondering why the prayer wasn't mentioned. I do not have the belief that, oh, if I don't say this prayer, I'll be punished. Thank you. Um, it's really hard for me to answer that question because I wasn't, I don't know what prayer you're talking about. So, um, I mean, I'm not quite sure what the worry is. Um... I mean, if, if the, can anyone pass for me what the question actually is because i can't make i think sense there was it. something about julian said there was a storm and then there was a storm prayer that was said yes it was some prayer i actually read the prayer and then after that it was shown by some relative so i'm just asking it was where by this some relative exists. yes and it was, no, what's the word it was it was thrown by some relative no, they showed us some article that there was this short okay. prayer to say before or during a storm, that's all. No superstition of any kind was mentioned. So I'm wondering whether you're aware of such a prayer, because I don't think I've ever heard of it. And well, like To be said, perfectly honest, there are millions of prayers. And in fact, if you Google a prayer to say in a time of storm, yes, there are prayers. I mean, there are patron saints, there are saints you can pray to in time of thunderstorms, for example. Um, there are saints you can pray to when you've got a toothache prayers when you're having labor pains you know there are prayers for any number of occasions because somebody somewhere in 2000 years has written it down so if you ask me you know in abstraction is there a prayer to say during a storm yes uh is there more than one definitely um and you said that one was said well yes i'm sure one of these many thousands were said but you know obviously if you ask me which prayer I have no idea. Yeah, I think that's quite difficult, isn't it? I think we all have prayers that are said in times of distress or in times of stress or all sorts. But as I said, there is actually one best prayer to say, which is the Lord's Prayer. I agree. So if there's a storm and you think, what shall I pray? Say the Lord's Prayer. The Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, taught us that prayer. When the disciples said to him, Lord, teach us how to pray, these are the words he gave. So say that prayer. Agree. Okay, so I think that's the end of our questions uh, for today. Um, so it just um, is left for me to thank Father um, for his time and for Father to um, end this session with a prayer for us. We give you thanks, almighty God, for all thy graces and benefits, you who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So I look forward to our final session next week. Um, so uh, thank you very much for being with us. Um, just to make things easier, those of you who are on the management team here, uh, Maybe you can hang back rather than call me again because I need to go. Uh, so hang back if you want to have a debrief after everyone else has left. Okay. Yeah, I think we should too. Yeah. So we say good evening and goodbye to everybody and uh, see you all next week. Thank you very much. So Tony and Agnes and Faye will just stay behind and have a word with Father. Yep.